we're going to get started. So first, thank you all for coming to that demo day. Uh, it's very exciting today. We've had like four different talks and it, it was great to hear from all of you. Uh, initially, we're going to have like uh, Lindsay talking about like that's awkward and that's history. So they'll get like a little bit of a longer time because like they're presenting like a two, two desk uh, things. So, and uh, we're going to give that the time and then we're going to move into Amin. who's going to tell us about uh, a dask based distributed task queue library that he's been working on. And following that, James will tell us more about Pi uh, RS strings in DAS data frame and the most recent changes. And then to wrap up the day, uh, Jacob is going to be talking about launching a Jupyter DAS cluster on NVIDIA based command platform. So with that being said, I will like give the floor to Lindsay and then please take, take the floor and you're going to have around 10 minutes. And okay, cool. Thank questions. you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Uh, can everybody see that and read it? Can you bump the size a little bit? Just maybe one notch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a, come on. There we go. You can zoom in. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, how about that? All right, cool. Good. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks for having me here. I'm Lindsey Gray. I'm a staff scientist at First, uh, Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. I work on the compact muon solenoid experiment, which is based in Geneva, Switzerland. Um, and I've been working in high energy physics since my sophomore year of undergrad. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about how to do, uh, uh how to do analysis. And this has uh, changed in the last four or five years to really having a heavy focus on NumPy like idioms. And now also using Dask because it gives us a really comfortable abstraction away from uh, resource schedulers into scheduling tasks that are then executed by something that knows how to schedule them better than we do. Um, in general, uh, what we're gonna see today is at the scale of like single files, um, but we have some really interesting challenges in high energy physics because we need to process uh, billions of events over 20 to 50 data sets in order to do our science and make reasonable inference. Um, and we're getting very, very close to that uh, in a completely new way using these packages, awkward array, uh, uproot, uh, dask awkward, dask histogram, coffee, uh, to compose all this together and actually have really richly expressive uh, ways of writing high energy physics analysis in Python that gives us all of the tools that we're used to working with from the uh, very beginnings of high energy physics. Uh, like the, I mean, the way we use histograms is kind of unique and goes all the way back to the 70s with Fortran and stuff. Um, so we have a lot of scaling challenges. We have expressibility challenges. We have unique modes of uh, conveying summaries of our data to people. And uh, I'm going to show you how we've melded that into the Dask ecosystem now. Uh, and I should say that the authors of Uproot and Awkward Array and Hist, uh, or some of the authors of Hist and all these other packages are in, in the audience right now. Uh, so I'll do the simplest thing we possibly can and show you uh, like the very basics of what we do in a high energy physics analysis, which is uh, reading in a file asking for a particular phys physical quantity. In this case, this is the transverse momentum of the missing energy, which is uh, essentially a vector sum and the opposite of that vector sum. And we're going to make a plot of that. So we have a histogramming, uh, histogramming package uh, that can take in arrays and we can in one line define what the ax or sorry, what the axis of the histogram should be. It's spinning and make nice labels. Um, and you can see, uh, so this is a basically the expected plot. It has the uh, detector resolution folded into it. Um, and it takes about three seconds in order to run over uh, this one slice of the 16 gigabyte file that we're putting in. Uh, so this is very minimal uh, and does not represent uh, like the fullness of an analysis, of course, but it's showing you the functionality that we kind of use. Uh, so, the next thing uh, that we're going to do is look at what this looks like in Dask, and you'll notice that it looks almost exactly the same, which is what we've been working at for the uh, past couple of years at this point. Uh, so we get the usual task, uh, Dask task graphs. You can see that we get all the leaves of uh, reading in the partitions of the file uh, if we specify uh, 10 steps for file, and we can inspect it in the usual ways that you may expect. So uh, this is already going into Dask awkward behind the scenes and things like that. Um, 
And then we can also do interesting things like interrogate what, exactly which columns we would like to read from the input data file. Um, so taking all of that and putting it into the same uh, example that I showed you above in just the uh, eager way of doing things, we can run Dask. And instead of taking almost two seconds, we're down to nearly half a second and we get the same plot out with more or less the same syntax aside from uh, that compute, of course. So now everything is going through a delayed computation and it's constructed this uh, very pleasant compute graph uh, without us even uh, asking to, which is something that's only very recently been part of high energy physics analysis. Um, and this allows us all sorts of abstractions on the computing side that we're really excited about. So this was really simple. Uh, high energy physics analysis tends to not be very simple and we'll see now exactly how not very simple that can be. Um, and the main reason for uh, these, uh, the, or the main reason for HEP analysis not being very simple is that it is highly, highly structured data. Um, our data sets, as I said before, are composed of billion events, uh, billions of events, up to billions of events, um, that are uh, essentially collections of the outputs of, of some really very fast cameras, uh, up, up to the order of, uh, uh, bill, or eventually billions of sensors. Um, and we compose all of that data together using pattern recognition algorithms to actually come up with particle hypotheses. So we come up, or we take all this information that you see here, uh, to some extent in the first uh, example of what an event looks like in high energy physics, we compose that into more of this like pictorial representation here, where instead of the different components of the event that you saw in this one, now we have entire concepts like a muon or an electron or a charged hadron emanating from the, uh, uh, the collision point and going through our detector because these different kinds of particles leave different signatures. And so we can use that information to reconstruct what happened uh, in a particular event than a high energy physics collision. And uh, this lends itself to an extremely object oriented way of thinking about what is in our events. Um, but that also means that uh, we're dealing with events that can have varying number of uh, muons, electrons, charged hadrons, et cetera, uh, every single time we perform uh, one of our experiments, which is a collision that happens at roughly 40 megahertz. And uh, that means that our, uh, not only are our data categorized very heavily, but they have very jagged structures, and they're generally kind of difficult to manipulate uh, without a for loop. Uh, this is what the package awkward solves. It allows us to uh, manipulate these jagged data very efficiently with NumPy-like idioms. And uh, to merge the array-like nature of awkward or of awkward arrays and kind of the NumPy-like idioms with this extremely object-oriented tack of how we organize the data in our events, uh, we created on top of all of this, this package called nano events, which allows us to have all the typical groupings of uh, high or uh, sorry, categories of high energy data represented in an object-oriented way, but also expressed in terms of uh, or in, in terms of their underlying arrays. So we create this nice abstraction between the way we manipulate our data and how we represent it on disk that allows us to keep very efficient modes of thought while also keeping very efficient modes of computing. Um, and to show you exactly how uh, quickly this goes off the rails, um, I'm going to show you uh, first how we manipulate data in high energy physics, a quick overview, and then something that's much more realistic to what we typically do in a high energy physics analysis. So we're going to use nano events uh, to read some data uh, from this little test file here uh, that's uh, in one of our repositories. And you can see that we've split it up into basic categories and there's about 20, 30 of them here. And you can see things like uh, the missing ET that I was accessing earlier. There's uh, jets and muons and other uh, uh, colloquialisms that describe uh, uh, pieces and parts of high energy physics data analysis. And uh, if we dive into, for instance, the piece that's representing muons, we can see that we can uh, ask the muon for its fields. Uh, so it's acting like an object or, or a typical object or thing. Um, and we can go in, get the muons uh, transverse momentum and see that we get a Dask future from that. And then of course, compute it. So it's all very, uh, all very natural the way that this is composing together in order for us to use it. Um, and this gets immediately more complex if we wanna start uh, accessing information about our simulation. 
So we have to keep extremely detailed uh, accounts of uh, high energy physics event simulation so that we can uh, either uh, interrogate that to uh, better construct our analyses or use it to create uh, fairly precise ML data sets so that we know exactly what we're training to and things like that. And in this case, uh, what Dask Awkward and uh, Awkward Array have allowed us to do is to really concisely uh, write down manipulations of this generator information. And I think that's particularly important. Like this four line statement uh, allows us to select events that are mu or sorry, select uh, particles that are muons in each event uh, and make sure that they're the uh, muons that are emanating from what's called the matrix element. Uh, which uh, describes the probability of certain interactions happening. So I want to see, in this case, for muons that are from the matrix element, uh, what their parent particle are uh, particle is, and uh, just have that printed out for me so that I can start to understand what's going on in each event. And in this case, we get a whole bunch of 23s. And those 23s means that it's coming from a thing called a, B, a Z boson, which is the neutral component of the... Uh, uh, the weak force in nature. And this means that everything looks good because muon or pairs of opposite sign pairs of muons only comes from uh, neutral particles. And in this case, it's a neutral particle. So cool. Um, but you can get more and more complex and refined with this. Um, and you can do it all through uh, uh, fancy indexing, which is really amazing compared to writing for loops and, try and if statements and really uh, getting into some intricate code and in order to describe what you need. So going onwards, uh, let's start up a cluster. Let's uh, instantiate a whole bunch of boilerplate. These are corrections in high energy physics. We're going to be sending, mm, oh, a good eh, like 20, 30 megabytes out to the cluster in order to do this. One of the corrections you can see is extremely large. Um, and we're going to stick all that together. And uh, this is actually where the magic happens. So we're defining a histogram that has oh, one a- One minute around. Thank you, I'm Let's... almost done. Awesome. Um, uh, defining a histogram that has uh, a, a axis for systematics, and we're going to plot the PT. Uh, we have a weight that we need to calculate for different variations of how we're reconstructing the energy of these things called jets in our events. And we're calculating that energy, uh, getting the, or, uh, or sorry, calculating that weight by getting the information about that varied jet, then filling the histogram with that specific variation of the reconstructed jet energy and uh, creating a task graph from that for all, in this case, 111 variations. And that's actually a fairly typical number for an analysis. So all that took on the front end about half a second. Uh, if we want to peek under the hood, this very small snippet of a standard thing you do in analysis generated a 2000 layer task graph on a single file. Um, and then we can compute it and check the output. And you can see this takes a little while to compute, um, about five seconds it should be, unless it's being angry. Uh, okay, so now you can see that we have all these different categories of uh, systematic variations that we filled into the histogram. And we have, uh, for each of these projections, a different PT distribution that represents a systematic variation. Uh, and we filled that all in a single statement with a very concise piece of code that lets us accurately track exactly what we're doing. So this is really changing the way that we can do high energy physics analysis, making everything cleaner and more analyzable. And uh, I think that's awesome. So I think that brings me to the minute. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thank you very much, Lindsay. Do we have any questions from the audience? Great talk, Lindsay. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, what kind of like traction is the stack getting in the in the HEP community? Like, I'm thinking uh, particularly like the Dask, the Dask portion of the slice the, of the stack. Ah, so the this particular implementation with the Dask uh, task graphs way more integrated and everything is extremely new. Like, this is based off of uh, for for the nano events part. That's really the in the organization of the data. That's still in release candidate. Uh, for Dask Awkward and all the uh, histogramming stuff, uh, those are all fully in release and people are starting to use them. Where we see a lot of traction right now is with uh, uh, that package called Uproot and Awkward Array. And we use uh, Dask more in uh, the mode of Dask delayed for the majority of analyses that are using this. And it's something like... Uh, the last time I checked, it was somewhere around like 50 analyses or something out of 200-ish uh, uh, ongoing analyses in CMS. 
So it's it's gaining traction and people like the interface from the feedback that I get back. So uh, it seems to be going in the right direction. And uh, this is going to be a pretty big change. Uh, but we're trying to make it as uh, interface similar as possible so that the change is uh, not not too uh, grating for people. Sure, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, this is exciting. Awesome. Thank you very much, Lindsay. And we are coming out uh, to our next talk, which is going to be given by Amin. Amin is going to yes, talk about uh, DASQ, uh, DASPACE distributed task queue. Um, so yeah. Uh, I mean, take the floor. Great. Uh, thank you, everybody, for for the opportunity to to present the Dasky library. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, I hope you can see uh, you can see the screen. Is everything is okay? Looks good. Great. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, I'm uh, I'm in the OC. I'm a Moroccan freelance data scientist and data engineer. I currently work on uh, document artificial intelligence. I love all things software engineering. I, I love distributed system, of course. I'm also an amateur grappler and, and kickboxer. Uh, you can find me on GitHub. I also uh, Twitch on, uh, do live coding on, on Twitch. And uh, I write technical blog posts on Medium. And of course, you can contact me on LinkedIn on any other platform. So today, I'm going to present uh, DASQ, which is a, a lightweight, uh, persistent distribution, distributed task queue. Uh, based entirely on Dask, which is a, a mouthful, but it's basically a, a pure Python library written on top of Dask actors to distribute tasks as messages between a queue pool, which is based, uh, traditionally called a broker, and a consumer pool, which is uh, traditionally called workers. So if you're familiar with the systems like Celery or RabbitMQ or RMQ, Dask queue uh, basically provides the same interface and the same capabilities, but based entirely on Dask. Okay, so uh, Dask is a Python library, so you can uh, basically pip install it uh, on your environment. Uh, and then let's define a simple task that we want to distribute and uh, share with the with our consumer pool, which is uh, basically a sum of, uh, of uh, a list of integers. Now uh, we're going to connect to our already running uh, local Dask cluster. Uh, for now, um, the Dask library uh, uh, needs uh, the, the direct to uh, workers flag set to true to uh, reduce communication overhead between the clients and the workers. Uh, once this is set up, uh, we can start our queue pool and our consumer pool. So basically the, the queue pool shares um, a unique queue with the consumer in a round robin fashion so that the consumer can fetch work uh, continuously from this queue. So let's start a queue pool of two queues. Uh, now we see that our queue pool is instantiated with the two transient queues. I'm gonna come back to this later. And we have zero pending items. Then I'm going to start a consumer queue, uh, pool sorry, of uh, two consumers. And uh, each consumer is going to be assigned a single queue in this, uh, in this queue pool. To submit work, uh, we basically have to call the submit method on the, the queue pool. Uh, we're going to submit uh, 10 tasks. And we see that each queue receives five items uh, on, uh, in, its, uh, in its memory. Then we're going to start the consumer pool to actively start fetching work from, uh, from each queue and join on it uh, to wait that the consumers uh, are done. Now we see that uh, the consumer pool, we can retrieve uh, the, the results from the consumer pool, uh, pool when it's done by calling the results uh, method on it. And uh, basically the, the result is, uh, is a dictionary of uh, worker uh, results, which is also a dictionary of uh, messages to, to results. Uh, okay. So great, we all uh, we all know Dask. Dask already provides this uh, this kind of interface to submit work. So why uh, would I uh, create this Dask queue library? Uh, so the, the major problem Dask queue tries to solve is to uh, solve the, the central scheduling problem and uh, the limit that the central scheduler of Dask uh, provides, which is 4,000 tasks a second. Uh, in high throughput scenarios, when we don't need this kind of uh, amazing intelligent scheduling, uh, we are bottlenecked by the, by the scalar uh, throughput, which is 4,000 tasks a second, and uh, sending more tasks, uh, like sending a million tasks to, to scalar can bring it to a halt and uh, basically uh, uh, stop uh, your whole cluster. To illustrate this, I'm going to start uh, a, consumer, a first consumer pool of five consumers, and then I'm going to send 100,000 messages to the queue pool. I'm going to use the batch submit uh, method uh, to start uh, to, to send the messages to, to QPool. And um, we're, we're going to monitor the CPU of the scheduler. And of course, we see that it's going to be uh, very stable. We see here uh, a peak in the network, uh, which is uh, roughly 100 megabytes of, uh, of data sent to our consumer pool. 
uh, through our queue pool, sorry. And now we can, we're going to start the consumer pool to start consuming uh, the task from uh, from uh, from this uh, queue pool. Okay, great. So uh, the second major features that the the queue task queue provides is uh, durable queues. Uh, so there are two type of queues in uh, in task queue: uh, a transient queue, which basically stores and serves messages from memory, and a durable queue that uses on disk data structures uh, to save the state of the queue pool and uh, to basically serve it from uh, from disk. Um, I wrote an in-depth blog post where I uh, discuss uh, various implementation details of this storage layer because it's, it was uh, written from scratch uh, to provide fast uh, serving and uh, fast uh, uh, login to of, of messages. So uh, how do we use this dusk, uh, the, this uh, durable queues? We, I'm going to start uh, restart the, the cluster, and then I'm going to start a queue pool of uh, two queues with the durability flag set to durable and point it to a directory patch. Uh, so for each queue is going to have its own uh, directory uh, to store messages in. And we see that uh, we have two types of file, uh, a log file and an in, in index file, which is a, which I call an index segment. The index segment file basically stores pointers to offsets in the log file. And the log file is an append-only file uh, that, uh, that is in a log structure way to uh, append the actual messages to disk. So let's try and uh, put 100,000 messages uh, in our queue pool. And uh, I'm going to simulate a sudden cluster shutdown. Uh, for example, uh, let's say we put uh, all, the, all the messages in, uh, in, our, in our queues, and then we had, uh, we had to, to restart our cluster after serving this uh, th these messages. I'm going to wait a little bit so that the, the queues are full. OK, great. Now we see that we have 50,000 pending items. OK, so now, now let's restart the, the cluster, which cleans, uh, cleans all, the work, all the actors in the, in the workers. And uh, just to be sure, I'm going to try to access the queue pool handle. And of course, we see that the, we lost the, the actual handle, and we can't, we can't access the, the previous queue pool. So now let's start a fresh, a fresh queue pool and point it to the same directory. And uh, of course, now we see that we have the 50,000 pending item in each queue, and we can start consuming them uh, like, we, like we did previously. Uh, so this storage mechanism basically provides uh, stability uh, to, uh, to the dust queue. OK, so thank you all for, for your attention. That's it for me. This project is still uh, is in its in infancy. And uh, I'll be more than happy to, to get any feedback or any questions on, uh, on, this, uh, on this project. Thank you all for your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Amin. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? I see someone raising his hand. Lindsay? Yeah. 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 Uh, no, this is really, really interesting. And, and thanks for showing this off. Uh, Thank you. My, my first question is, uh, what's the, how, how much work is there until this is also a uh, configure or, you know, behind a configurable Git inside of uh, Dask so that we can take a task graph and layer it instead of using the futures interface? Oh, that's, uh, that's not for me to say, I guess. So uh, I, I guess that's now, now it's a separate project. It's, uh, it's really in a version 0.2. So I guess uh, we have to- Right, sure. It. But I mean, even, even in that case, uh, like you could imagine this having, or imagine this being some addition to Dask, not part, not, not part of mainline Dask. Yeah but still let people use dash.compute with the right client, things like that. Um, in, in terms of getting, because of, yeah, these, uh, um, you know, super large scale task graphs are the bread and butter of the field that I work in. And so a project like this, that's really robust to scale, uh, I find very interesting. But of course, I also want the extremely pleasant interfaces that we get uh, for asking for uh, computation of a task graph through task, et cetera. Yeah. So and yeah, I guess what what I'm asking is how much is the rest of the way, which is sort of a bad question to ask. But uh, yeah. uh, how much is the rest of the way, man? <laughs> uh, well, I guess I guess task queue is, is really great for for this use case of having a, a large task graph. But also, it's uh, it's quite dumb to because it's uh, basically a queue that we put to work in and then we retrieve it. Um, basically, we, we can have a lot of uh, different queues, etc. But uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be. It could be a nice uh, backend for Dask in a, a low-level session. I would encourage like uh, presenters to in the issue in the GitHub issue for this session to post uh, a comment that has like links to your project, your blog post, uh, 
your notebooks if you have them. And yeah, that would be great. And then for some of you, if you uh, if you've never been like every month, there is like a DAS community meeting, and then like you can just get more familiarized with the project in general, and they're open, public, so then everyone can show up. Uh, uh, that that will be great, and then like we all can get more uh, visibility on everyone's projects. Uh, all right, so moving on to the next talk, uh, James, I believe you are up next. Uh, Tim is going to be talking to us about the new the news about Pyro strings and DAS data frames that came with Pandas 2.0 and um, how's this been integrated with Dask? Awesome. Uh, cool, yeah, so um, Pandas 2.0 was released recently, maybe last week, maybe the week before. Um, a big part of that release is improved support for Pyro backed data types, um, obviously in, in Pandas. Um, so sort of in conjunction with that release, Dask has a new feature um, that uh, allows you to automatically use PyArrow strings in Dask data frame. So this is a uh, sort of quick demo. The, there's a blog post here you can go check out with, um, and I'll, Nadia, I'll send you the notebook so you can uh, disseminate it, but um, where you can go check out basically this example and some additional context around it. So what I'm going to do here is um, run through an example where we have this automatic pyro strings turned on. So the interface is pretty minimal. Um, it's just setting this config value. So data frame convert string true. By default, it's turned off. Maybe in the future, this will be turned on. This does require uh, pandas 2.0, like I mentioned, and it requires you to have pyro installed. If you just you know conda install das from conda forge, you'll already have all that stuff installed for you. Um, so here I'm going to go ahead and I'm spinning up a cluster. Um, I'm using coiled uh, to do that. So this is spinning up a cluster on, on AWS. I asked for 15 workers. I I'm happen to be spinning it up in US East too. It's not super important. The, the main point, the reason I'm doing that is because the data set I'm going to do in the next cell uh, is, is in US East two in that region. Um, so this cluster is spinning. I probably should have executed that cell beforehand, but that's okay. Um, we can go check out the cluster. This is the cluster that's being spun up right now. This is over in the, the coiled app. I just want to get a sense. Blue here means the workers are starting to be fully ready. We're almost to 100% ready. Okay, great. So my cluster is up and running. I now have those 15 workers. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up the um, dashboard just so we have that along for the ride. Um, if my screen manipulations work, there we go. Okay, cool. So I'm just going to do a sort of simple um, sort of a standard kind of uh, data analytics operation. So I'm going to read in a Parquet data set. It's, this is a publicly available data set. It's uh, an Uber, Uber Lyft taxi um, data set. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and persist that into memory. And we see it showing up in the cluster here. I'm just a bunch of read Parquet calls happening. So I'm going to load that data set into memory. And then I'm going to perform a, um, in this case, I'm just going to create some new column if whether or not the, the Uber or Lyft ride had a tip. And I'm going to do some group by operation and find the average fraction of, of tips um, per company. So I'm going to go ahead and do that operation. And here's the result. Um, and we can see that took about uh, two, two and a half seconds to actually perform. So that's that's the uh, I should also say this took a, about 95 gigabytes when I when I loaded the entire data set on the cluster about 95 gigabytes of, of data and took about uh, two and a half seconds to perform this operation. I'm now going to go ahead and redo that exact same computation, but now with pyro strings turned off and we'll see what happens so um, to turn off them I just again, this is the default so you just go ahead and flip that switch off. And unfortunately, the, the first thing we need to do is actually create a bigger cluster. Um, as we'll see, um, we if, if we were to use those same 15 worker, that same 15 worker cluster, we would have a bad time thinking there'd be a bunch of spilling to disk. It would uh, take it would take a very long time. So here I'm going to scale up to the same sort of class of workers, but I, instead of 15, I'm going to ask for 45 of them. Um, I can go back to coiled and see. So here's the 15 workers I can now see. Oh, I asked for four, I asked for a lot more. There's 45. Provisioning instances are happening right now. Um, they're green here means ah, those, in, in, those instances are up on AWS. They're now starting to pull down their um, 
software environments, and then the workers will come online after that. Um, well, I guess while we're waiting for that for a second, I'll just kind of skim through here. We can see the scheduler, workers, we can like download logs for all of our workers. It's just kind of a nice experience for folks who want to do some cloud computing with Dask. Okay, so blue means the workers are ready. We can see it's climbing up. It's almost to 100% there. Almost all the workers are um, have pulled their Docker images and are ready to go. Any questions at this point? Just waiting for those last few workers to come up. Okay, we are going to pull the safety hatch. Like all good demos, let's see if this, uh, oh, there we go, cool. I secretly have an, another cluster that's already up running in the background, but that one just came on. So we've got our 45 workers. So let's do literally the exact same computation. So here I'm going to read in the exact, exact same data set. We'll see those read parquet calls happening. Uh, you'll notice there's a lot, maybe a lot more bars here. I have three times as the cluster is three times as big now. Um, and what we'll see is once this thing is fully loaded before it was something like, well, what did I say it was before it was something like 95 gigabytes when it was in memory. Now it's going to be like 225 ish in memory, something like that. Yeah, around 225 gigabytes in memory. So the data set's much larger when you're not dealing with pyro strings. Let's go ahead and do the, the same exact computation again as well. And there's the result. So the, the result's exactly the same, but notice this took 5.2 seconds. So what was it before? Two and a half. So it's a it's about takes about twice as long in this case to do this particular computation. And it takes a lot more memory. So I had to, it also takes a lot more cost. I had to have a cluster that was three times as big to perform sort of a similar, similar operation. Um, okay, and that's that's it. That's just kind of a brief uh, overview of Pyre, of automatic Pyre strings and Dask. This is a significant win for the like entire PyData community. These these Pyro back D types. Um, they're also a work in progress. So uh, the sort of ask here is if folks would try them out. So you can go ahead and in your existing Dask data frame code just. Uh, so in particular, if you're working with text data, just go ahead and turn the switch on and let us know what your experience is like. Um, it works generally pretty well, but people are going to run into edge cases and we'd like to know what your experience is like. So here's this issue in the Dask repo where you can share your experience. Um, okay, that's it with that. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, I think I commented, but uh, may, maybe it got lost in the wash. I believe for this particular data set, uh, the column that you're looking at is nicely categorical. So I um, suspect that actually you would get even better memory footprint and performance if you dealt with it categorically. Um, but obviously strings, the pyro strings are better than Python strings. I just think that maybe categorical might have been better in this case. Yeah, it depends. Um, you're, you're right, this is a really low card. Uh, here, here are all the, the string values. It's a really low cardinality data set. So yeah, if you're dealing with low cardinality, that um, uh, categoricals can be could be nice. Another nice thing about pyre strings is they release the gil much more often. They're more gil friendly than categorical d types. So operations like the group by operation um, could you uh, you could still have improved parallelism, I think, in the pyro case. Um, I, I have a very quick follow up too. Actually, now that I think sure. about that, I wonder if. Um, Anyone's talked to Pyro about the option of interning Python strings that should be able to, because because there's lots of duplicate strings here. So even if they were Python strings, it should be possible to bring the memory footprint way, way down somehow, but I don't know how that would work. Yeah, there's some ongoing conversations about that exact topic, yeah. Okay. Thank That's you. a good point, Martin. Yeah. I think we have room for one more question. I don't know who is next in the queue, and then we'll just Go to Jacob, and then we'll recap at the end. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Um, oh, okay, it's, it's really quick question. Uh, it was uh, it's uh, in the in the config you said the backend should be Pyro. Does do we have to import the whole uh, data set as a Pyro batch, or do we choose that the uh, a, a specific column, which is string, has to be Pyro? 
Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Any, um, any string columns? So th this will convert any string columns automatically. Okay. Thanks. So, uh, like this does not use pyro ints or pyro floats or things like that. If, if, if that's also part of the question, so just, yeah, yeah. just text data. Yeah. Okay, great. Oh, so I'll suggest let's jump on to the next doc and then we'll circle okay. back at the end to questions uh, overall for all the docs. So next up is Jacob. Jacob is going to be talking to us about launching a Jupyter DAS cluster on NVIDIA base command platform. So Jacob, take the floor. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, yeah, I wanted to show you some stuff that's kind of happening in NVIDIA at the moment that I think think will be interesting to folks that want to do kind of training models or or you know kind of any large scale GPU workload on the cloud. So like a little while ago, it was like NVIDIA's big conference and they announced this thing called DGX Cloud. And this is kind of the beginning of this, you know, this demo that I wanted to show is kind of what is that? What does that mean? Where's this going? Um, this is all kind of like early access preview type stuff, um, but thought it'd be good to, to show. So NVIDIA's DGX Cloud is, is kind of this, this way of accessing cloud compute and NVIDIA stuff all together as like a managed service. Um, the like first iteration of it is going to be backed by Oracle's cloud, but then they'll also be deploying it on Google Cloud or Azure and, and wherever folks' data is, right? To make it make it easier to get into. So there's a lot of terms, right? Everybody's is one of those companies with lots of marketing stuff. So let me just dig through some words so you understand them, and then we can kind of dive into actually what that means. So DJX Cloud itself has a service called Base Command. Base Command is like a, a batch job scheduler, workflow engine kind of tool. Um, if you buy like a big compute cluster from NVIDIA or use one of these new cloud services that, that is coming, you'd be able to use the, the base command, like job scheduling and workflow engine. And to access all of that, we access that through this portal called NGC. Folks may have come across NGC because it's kind of like the one-stop portal for NVIDIA cloudy things. So you'll find container images, pre-built models, notebooks, like all that kind of stuff you find in NGC. All of this new stuff is gonna be available through NGC as well. Um, so let me just try not to get too ahead of myself. If I just jump into NGC, when anybody signs up to NGC and logs in, you'll see this kind of this kind of portal. But if you like join the base command preview or whatever, um, you'll see a few like extra options here. And we have one thing, ignore some of these names. These are all kind of like proof of concept names, but we have this, this like project section in base command. Um, and this is kind of like project templates for the, the batch job scheduler. They can start up like DAS clusters, Spark clusters, whatever, like kind of distributed compute cluster. Um, it's based around the model of having like a Jupyter notebook driving some cluster of compute. Um, we have templates with like all sorts of different stuff. As you can see, this is all about developer and work in progress. But if I click into one of these templates, you kind of get you know, a reasonably familiar option. You choose like, what region am I gonna run this workload in? These regions will be like on the various cloud providers or you know wherever you want that to be. Um, and you can go in and like edit the project and say, um, you know, I'm going to run it in this region. I want to pre-mount some data into my container. I want to use one of these container images from NGC. So like the default here is like the Rapids core container image, which has got Dask and, uh, you know, all the kind of tools that you'd want. But then it's also got like extra bits so you can install extra packages at runtime. So I wanted to show you like a little hyperparameter optimization demo that we have. So I would go in here, choose like the, the latest Rapids build. We'd probably want Optuner in here. And we want to say, oh, I want, you know, six task workers or whatever. You can set environment variables and other startup scripts, all the kind of stuff you'd expect. And then you hit run at the top. Um, I'm going to skip that because it's about job scheduler. I don't want to sit in a queue, you know, in a short demo like this. So I already have a cluster running. This is kind of what I would get that would appear. This is kind of giving me a view onto this like batch job that I've submitted they do have this cloud is like based around the idea of having like a maximum wall time of all of your jobs so i started like an hour-long job at the beginning of this this session just to make sure i had time to run but you can kind of tweak these numbers to whatever you want to be but if you use one of these templates it like pre proxies different things to you to make them accessible so we have a jupyter link that i can click and open up jupyter lab i think i've already got it open in a couple of places anyway let me just move my window so i can see it so I can open up Jupyter Lab and access the Jupyter job that's running in there. And you know, this is running on some, some NVIDIA node somewhere, I think, for this demo. Um, this has got eight V100 GPUs in this node. Um, but you know, other ones are, are available. And then I've also got other links I can click. So I can click on like the DAS dashboard um, link. 
And I think by default, when it starts the task scheduler on here, it uses the WebSocket protocol. So that also can be accessed via this like web proxying magic that's going on. Um, so like in my notebook, I can then go and grab like an actual notebook I want to use. Here's one from our like Rapids docs. If I like just copy that link and, and W get the notebook file. Download the file into my session. I can then, you know, start working through my notebook with some nice GPUs and do things. I've got drivers installed, I've got wrappers installed, I've got all that kind of stuff, and I've got Dask ready, and I also have this Dask cluster running. Um, the first thing I probably want to do is connect to this Dask cluster. As I said, this is like a preview, so we haven't actually like baked in the, this, you shouldn't have to include this URL really, we should bake that in. Um, and then I can go into here as well and grab the Dask dashboard URL and throw that into JupyterLab, so I can access all the Dask dashboard plots. Um, and Dask knows when you've got GPUs running in your cluster, um, it turns on like the GPU memory and GPU utilization plots and like other useful things to see, see in your Dask cluster. Uh, so let's have the task stream and make some progress bars. There you go. You can see I've been playing with this already, but I'm just going to run through some like, you know, this is like an Optuna hyperparameter training notebook that we have. You can just kind of see stuff running in the in this setup, and uh, I think this one's just a little dummy one. But then there's like a bit of like a, a longer example here, which loads in some some sample data from Scikit-Learn and submits like a whole bunch of like XGBoost training jobs using Optuna to do, you know, HPO basically. So if I submit a bunch of trials, you see Dask start uh, progress bars kind of spring to life. It starts doing its thing. Um, GPU utilization is Seems to be around 40% for running this training. So I'm guessing there's some like IO bottom back in here um, from wherever that data is being read from. But there's all sorts of things you can do to tweak that. But you can just see what's going on. Um, Dask is like well integrated with, with what's going on on the GPU. And it's pretty easy to get up and running. Um, I'll just get those cubes when it's, when it's done. So it's just going to run through and, and basically print out some plots in a second once it's finished this. This training. But the main thing I wanted to show is once you once you signed up to to DJS Cloud or, or whatever, you can um, quite quickly spin up a Dask cluster with all the GPU bells and whistles installed. There's to use GPU stuff. It tends to be like extra steps. So like this has kind of baked all of that in out of the box for you. Uh, and then when you finish, you can just come in and hit you know shut down, and, and that will shut down after a certain time as well. So yeah, that was that was a reasonably quick demo, but that was that's kind of what I wanted to share. I hope that was interesting. Awesome. Thank you, Jacob. Do we have any questions? Uh, I see Martin, you have your hand up, but I don't know if it's from before or if it's for this one. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to put it down. Okay, no worries. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I do have a question text for, uh, for the presentation. Uh, so in my team, we have the GX machine. Do we, do we have access to this uh, platform or is it uh, for an on-premise uh, machine or do we have to, to, to run it on the cloud? Yeah, so if you if you're using the like DGX operating system or whatever, that I think integrates with all of this. So once once oh, this okay. like feature gets toggled on, you should be able to just make use of your own hardware as well through this. Okay, great. Okay. I uh, will like open the floor for questions regarding like any talks. We have like ten between ten and thirteen more minutes uh, in the call. So folks like have questions. I know Lindsay, you have one for our, the arrow. Um, talk so uh, yes, I did. Um, so it's going back to that, and yeah, uh, on the awkward and panda side of things, we're actually uh, pretty. I'm pretty interested in seeing those those interfaces unify, and I know that there's uh, awkward or an awkward interface that can uh, back pandas, and then awkward can also be itself backed by Pyro and uh, anything you can put into that. Uh, but I don't know where things are going with respect to the delayed implementation through Dask data frame. Uh, do you know how easy or easy or hard uh, adding that in is going to be? Because I, I, I know there's already a way that we can get uh, the, the awkward uh, Sorry, awkward expressions and essentially acceleration of higher order function queries in pandas uh, done through awkward, but it sounds like there's 
it, it seems like there may yet be some things to do in order to uh, get this into uh, Dask data frame and things like that. If if you're aware of any of that, I'm not I'm not sure how widely that's known, uh, James. So if you can't comment, yeah, no, I'm not super familiar with Dask awkward. Um, okay, I, if I can, it can be I back can by, if... yes. Yeah. Oh, oh sorry, yeah, Martin. sure, Martin, since you're here, yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, for those that don't know, um, Orchid Pandas is a repo that exists that allows you to have uh, Orchid arrays as an extension array within Pandas. That can include simple string types, or it can include, it include uh, the full nested loveliness that is allowed in Orchid, which is essentially the same model as is allowed by uh arrow but it gives you access to additionally to the awkward namespace all the functions that are there and the numpy like api so it's very convenient for the string operations it specifically uses arrow to do those string operations so you should have exactly the same performance as directly using a pyro strings um, column as far as integrating with das data frame i have a pr that starts that process it doesn't work now for um a number of sort of edge reasons, such as if you do any kind of map partitions, of which there are there are many different types, uh, many different places where we do that, the calculation of the meta fails because uh, Desk is not aware of the requirements of awkward. So my PR uh, makes a start on that, and and um, some things work, but there's probably I, I will probably approach maybe. James, who's just gone through this kind of process to smooth those things out and uh, get things working. So then you should have full DAS data frame um, usage with some of your columns being awkward and you'll be able to use the awkward namespace and uh, API on those columns. Cool, I, yeah, I just, uh, I guess I'm coming at this from the perspective that it would be really nice to be able to expose awkward through pandas to make it uh, more familiar to a lot of people instead of, its current place of being this uh, interesting hep obscurity, although it's it's making ground for sure. Yeah, I don't know how to make the, the community aware. <laughs> we make examples and blog posts, right? Yeah, examples, blog posts, and making it really, really easy. Nice. Um, I would say not. Like, if you know someone that can or yourselves wants to give uh, another demo in the future, like go ahead to the Dask community. There's like a sign up issue there. Uh, I will probably bulk hunting down some folks and, and then try to get more talks in it for May. Uh, we already have two lined up for May. We're probably going to be looking for two or three more. So if you know someone, please share with them. And for all of, the, all of you that gave a talk today, uh, Please go ahead and post on the on the community issue. I will update when we have the video recording. But in the meantime, if you have notebooks, public and and stuff, or blogs or things that you want to share about your talk, uh, you can go ahead and then post them in in the community issue too. All right. It sounds like this is it for today. Uh, thank you everyone that gave a talk today. This has been great. Uh, it's great to see so many folks are using Dask and then uh, so many folks have been interested on what, what we are like um, using this project for and then how the project keeps expanding. So um, really appreciate this. Thanks everyone. See you next Thank time. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.